Hello, everyone. Thank you. For, can you hear me? Sometimes I drop, I drop my voice. People can't understand. Hi, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. I'm Amy Chan Lindquist. I am the Director of Advancement here at Cooper Hewitt and could not be more thrilled and delighted to welcome Debbie and Lawrence this evening. I personally am such enormous, I, I feel like I'm fangirling all over the place <laughs> over them because I just, what both of them do is just so special. Um, but I have notes because I, I can't forget certain things. Um, so Lawrence, okay, sorry. Lawrence is a Grammy Award winning designer and the creative director and founder of um, Lad Design. Author of Supersonic, The Design and Lifestyle of Concord, he is, has been profiled by Monocle, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The Economist, British GQ, among many, many others. And we're so happy that he is here in New York um, sharing this moment with us. And then the infamous Debbie Millman, <laughs> um, who is just, I have to plug this a little bit, as the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award winner, um, National Design Award, celebrating our 20th year this year, so yay. Um, she is an author, an educator, a curator, and a, the host of the very, the most amazing podcast, Design Matters, which I'm sure all of you know of. <laughs> and if you don't, that's, you know, now you knew. Um, she was named one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company. So we could not be in better company this evening. Um, at Cooper Hewitt, for those of you, for your first time here, we create opportunities for everyone to discover the importance of design and its power to change the world through our exhibitions, education programming, and museum-wide initiatives. And what I think is so significant about this is that um, really this is such a passion project of Lawrence's. And um, the Concord's story truly embodies this spirit. It's an, it's, an, it's an emblem of possibility. Its design reflects a spirit of curiosity and optimism. It's about elegance and innovation in the highest form and the power of design to inspire and uplift. Tonight we will explore ideal visions of the future as expressed through the design, ingenuity, and enduring legacy of the Concord. What better duo to bring the Concord's story to life other than, uh, than Lawrence and Debbie? Truly. Um, so, and just a little um, FYI for you all to know. Um, tonight will also feature a book signing um, and a cash bar from 8 p.m. Books are available for purchase in our Cooper Hewitt shop and members get a special discount to shop and events such as this one. So if you enjoy tonight's event, talk to one of our shop representatives who can sign you up for a membership today. Um, we are also so thankful to Nina, Paper, and Lawrence's studio for this very memorable limited edition gift box. Um, and I will, on that note, I will turn it over. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you, Debbie and Lawrence. I just wanted to thank, uh, of course, the Cooper Hewitt, my dear friend, Amy Chan Linguist, the wonderful and inspiring Debbie Millman for being here. It's really fantastic to have you here tonight. And um, of course, our, our partners in making these special gifts for you tonight, uh, Nina Paper and LCP Printing, which we're gonna talk about that, uh, the, the, the gift a little bit in a, in a more. And most importantly, I wanted to thank all of you guys for coming out on a very humid Monday evening. So uh, it's really, really uh, special that you're here tonight to me because it is a, a passion project and a labor of love. But really, uh, we're not here exclusively to talk about an aircraft tonight. What we're really here to talk about is the power of design to unify, inspire, and uplift. To see through design a reflection of our best selves and what we can do when ingenuity, creativity, and determination come together. So a little bit of background to how I got started in design. Uh, I got my start at Warner Brothers Records. I have some friends from there tonight. It's also where I met 
my wonderful wife, Julie Muncie, who I'm super thankful that she's here tonight too. But yes, Julie, she is, of course. If you know Julie, you should be clapping for her. Um, but it's where I got to start working with artists such as the Red Hot Chili Peppers and uh, 20 Years with Wilco and uh, the Silver Sun Pickups, Herbie Hancock, Esperanza Spaulding, and so on. Uh, and it came to be not just a point of work, but an understanding that music serves as this crucial and critical point where we understand who we are as, as humans. No matter what continent you are on or what culture, music really helps you access that vital human connection. And art from music is what really provides the articulation of that experience. It provides evidence of being human. Uh, and it's really interesting as a designer who does artwork for music, you have the capacity to connect with people through that connection of, of design and music. And, and through creativity, you have the capacity to hopefully make a difference in other people's lives. Uh, but then this thing came along, and I am absolutely embracing of technology, which it's wonderful that we have these devices that where you can listen to any song, anywhere, anytime, any place, and it gives us wonderful access. But it's drastically changed the way we access and our relationship to music and the way we discover music and the way we understand music. And design, it has changed our relationship to music as it pertains to design. So it's, it's really caused a necessity for creative adaptation. adaptation. Adaptation is really what the Concord story is all about. It's about facing a challenge and answering it through creative solutions. So what my studio has done is, is we've authored an initiative where we've really come to understand that music is not just about listening, that design transforms the way music transforms us, that the intersection of where design meets music is where fashion, film, TV, branding, culture, and, and all these critical things about being a human alive in culture today all come together. And most importantly, music is the touch point where we access how music, uh, how we relate to music as far as uh, gender, class, race, political position, social structure. It also represents key life moments in our life cycle when you fall in love, when you've lost a loved one. Music is this kind of core touchstone to all of us around the world. And as our relationship through technology has changed in as as vis-a-vis -vis music, uh, our relationship to music as it is in design has changed too. So we've authored an initiative where we are compelling design students across the world to uncover different ways to uh, deepen the relationship to music through innovation in design, such as how do we experience and engage with music, uh, the, un, undercovering the life cycle of design and music, the visual translation and inter interpretation of music, and of course, curation and discovery of music. And it's called Designing the Future of Music, and it's manifesting as a design master's program at the California College of the Arts and the Royal College of Art in England. And we are also curating a show at the Museum of Design Atlanta that will be in the winter of 2020, uh, which Debbie also curated a show at Moda, which we're excited to be in good company there too. Uh, but for me in my studio, because I've been doing design uh, for so long uh, with these bands, that experience is all about the tangibility, because now that we live in a digital space, that tangibility uh, is ephemeral and fleeting that we connect to music on our phones. So this is an example of uh, Wilco's new record. I've been working with Wilco for 20 years. This is our seventh album with Wilco. This is also being printed by LCP. And we wanted to create something very tangible, very memorable, this keepsake that people wanted to touch and connect to the creative experience by holding it, by feeling it, by returning to it in their hands. So we've created this very elaborate pop-up book, which will be available October 4th, that has advent calendar doors and wheels that spins and cards that pull out. Uh, and then before we get to Concord, another, as we, as we migrate more towards science, Another story about tangibility as an object in design is our work on, as, as Amy Chen Linquist mentioned, the Voyager Golden Record, which um, if you know or not about, it's, it's a really kind of mind-blowing story. But basically in 1977, NASA launched these two little spacecraft, they're no bigger than a Honda Civic, uh, to 
pass by all the planets in our solar system. They realized that the way the planets were aligned in a certain way, that if this vehicle went out at a certain speed, it would pass by all these planets, giving us the first time look uh, at uh, our, our planetary neighbors uh, for the first time. And what we did was we had this crazy esoteric idea to put this record, a message, from Earth to extraterrestrials on the side of the spacecraft. They plated the record in gold because that's the only material that could withstand the, the cold temperatures of gold out there. And uh, just in the event that the extraterrestrials come into contact with the spacecraft. Now notice I didn't say like if ex extraterrestrials exist because we worked with Frank Drake on the project, the author of the Drake Equation, and if you could just read this really quickly, you'll probably know that this just states the probability of extraterrestrial life existing is very high um, just based on the number of planets, but we're not gonna get too much into extraterrestrials tonight, but it's really our message to them. What's on the record? Well, it was actually curated uh, just a couple of blocks from where we're sitting here tonight uh, by the ethnomusicologist Alan Lomax. It's considered basically the first world music compilation out there. And it's a portrait of ourselves. It's kind of a compilation of Earth's greatest music and its cultures. There's Bach and Beethoven and Blind Willie Johnson and Chuck Berry, Solomon Island Panpipes, 55 human spoken languages, uh, a beautiful sound poem containing the baby's cry, uh, whale sounds, a human kiss. Uh, it's, it's, it's a record of who we are and our greetings to uh, others out there. And then there's also uh, images of humanity on the, encoded in the grooves on the record. Today, we upload billions of images to Instagram a day. At the time of the, making of this record in 1977, there were only two companies in the country that were actually digitizing images. And they took that data of the images and they put that data in the grooves of the record. And just so in case you're wondering, I know where your minds are going, there is a uh, stylus in the case on the spacecraft so the, the extraterrestrials can play it. And there's also a diagram explaining <laughs> how to play it. But the, the, the images tell the extraterrestrials a story of who we are, where we are, our, our family cycles, eating, licking, and drinking, of course. <laughs> and just in case you just think this is all too esoteric, it actually works, the data uncoded from the records. If you just uncode it using the diagram on the record itself, it is actually, it, this, is, this is actually the images being decoded from uh, the record. That's actually Dr. Jane Goodall on the, on the right there. Um, which is just kind of like a f phenomenal idea that it wasn't just a concept, but it is kind of like the ultimate design project, this piece that's this encapsulation of who we are. And that's what we wanted to design when we did the 40th anniversary reissue. We wanted, we could have done something 70s, we could have done something spacey, but we wanted to design some, something that honored the legacy and the gravity and the weight of these ideas of who we are and how we want to say it. And we didn't want it to be bound by fashion or style, but we wanted it to be the type of piece that, um, if you did chuck it out into space and it flew out there for a thousand years, that if somebody picked it up, it would be this codex that people could understand what it meant and what it was about. And this is the record, as Amy mentioned, this is the record that we did win the Grammy for for Best Box Set and Package, and we did break Kickstarter's record for highest grossing music record, but I only mentioned that tonight vis-a-vis -vis the conversation about tangibility. I mentioned that because that's evidence that people want the artifact. They want that piece that they could hold on to and understand and spend time with and uncover and experience themselves. Let me prom pr promise you, nobody is like cleaning up their apartment or driving home and saying, I think I'm gonna put the Voyager Golden Record on, you know? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's like whale sounds and like hyenas on it. You know, this is not like easy listening, but definitely um, hundreds of thousands of people wanted this piece because they wanted a connection to the story. And that's the power of design. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So none of the original creators actually expected that extraterrestrials would understand Akkadian or Urdu or Somali. You see the messages on the record were actually messages for the inhabitants of this planet. And that's kind of the beautiful idea of the Voyager Golden Record. Carl Sagan, who put the committee together to put the record out there, he said, the launching of this bottle into the cosmic ocean, 
says something very hopeful about life on this planet. And the creative minds behind the creation of the record, they made a conscious decision not to include any images of war or disease or violence or poverty on the record. What you could say is it's an idealistic self-portrait. And the point is it's something for us to aspire to. And I think we need that today now more than ever, a reflection of our best selves and what we can be when we do aim to be our best. So as we consider how to explain ourselves, to others out there, we begin to consider who we are in a much deeper way. So this is the vehicle assembly room at Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena in my home, home town of California, home state of California. You could, this is where basically every, uh, every vehicle that America has made has been built in this room. You could see the mission patches up on the wall. And everything, uh, everything in this room has been built with a great sense of inspiration and a great sense of creativity. And as you walk into the room at JPL, there's this sign that says, Dare Mighty Things. And it's something that I think that we can implore ourselves to do, whether you're a designer or a writer or a teacher. But as we go into our work, that reminder that through creativity, through our best efforts, if we just remember to dare mighty things, we can elevate the entire human experience through the work that we put out there um, for others to experience. And that, that's kind of a principle that we love to embrace um, in, in our work, which brings us to the Concord, which is a funny paradox because sometimes to see our best future, you have to look backwards. So we're nearing the 20th year where, where, where the last Concord flight was 2003. 2.52.59, that's the hours, minutes, and seconds of the fastest transatlantic crossing from New York to London, under three hours. So Concord brought humanity together in real terms. Uh, if you have any flight time, you make the world a smaller place. So if you had a, an ailing family member that you had to get to right away, or a meeting or a, an event that you absolutely positively had to be there as soon as humanly possible, this was the vehicle to do it. It actually made the world a smaller place. Um, but it also made the world a smaller place through a unified goal. And as we look at the climb of civilization, uh, the advent of innovation in technology is intrinsically linked to big steps in human progress and, and the evolution of human progress. A lot of these, a lot of the darker side of humanity is also met at the end of these kind of uh, next steps of evolution, but it's also wonderful to see that through the evolution of transportation, uh, we see greater leaps and growths in, in our society, in, our, our, um, in, in humanity. But when you look back at some of these kind of earlier ideas of uh, the future, it, some of these ideas look kind of tentative or look kind of funny. Um, but the idea of the future, as far as fantasy, sometimes it has a fun way of leaving its thumbprint on reality. So here you have uh, the, um, the Jaguar, the, uh, the, the Corvette Stingray, the Citroen, and then Raymond Lowy's Studebaker Avanti. These are cars that are informed by that idea of fantasy, by that idea of inspiration, that they look like they could almost fly. The, the, the future is here tomorrow, today. And then, of course, you see these ideas also manifested in architecture of the day. Uh, I just took these pictures with my friends and my wife last weekend. We stayed out at the TWA Hotel at Kennedy. It's, it's incredible. But you're actually walking through a sculpture. This is by, of course, Eero Saarinen's TWA terminal. This sculpture, this building, is, is a poem to flight. It, and, of course, if you look at his Dulles Airport building as well, these, you have these cars and buildings and fashions that, that reflect the spirit of tomorrow in the day, that, that these buildings and cars look like that they could fly almost. But of course, they can't fly. They couldn't fly. But Concorde absolutely could fly, and it could fly beautifully. 
it was a reality that served as an emblem of possibility. Concord was such a beautiful flying machine that it was the only aircraft that remains so today that could keep a supersonic speed without the use of afterburners, and that includes military aircraft. That afterburners are where they light the fuel coming out of the engine to make the thing go faster. But because of the shape of it, it was so it's the ultimate case of form following function. It's kind of like why is a child's paper airplane the shape that it is? Because it's the most logical, beautiful shape for it to work that way. So the era of Concord, it brought a palpable hopefulness for a better future. It brought a spirit of curiosity and optimism. And it brought an idea of a better world to come. This is a view of our world from a different perspective that was also brought to us by daring and innovation and design and ingenuity and triumph and answering a challenge. A challenge that President Kennedy laid out to us when he said that we choose to go to the moon because that goal will serve to measure and organize the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we're unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. So here's the story about Concord where it gets a little even more interesting. All of these stewardesses, they all represented all the different airlines that were intended to fly Concord. American Airlines, United Airlines, Qantas Airlines, Iran Airlines. Everyone had orders for Concord. This was not intended to be this airplane for the elite only. It was, it was going to be, we were entering the supersonic age. Uh, so it was going to be very much um, part of a utopian ideal, that this was that logical next step of the future. Here's a diagram and the early models of the airport in my hometown, LAX. It was built as the jet port of the future. Now, as many of you know, who was anyone who's been there, it's the worst airport <laughs> ever. <laughs> but, um, but the, uh, you can see here at the gate, the Delta Wing Concords and the planning drawings, this serves as proof that we fully expected that we would all be flying around on Concords today. And it makes sense. If you look at the through line from propeller aircraft, then to jet aircraft, of course, supersonic aircraft is gonna be the next logical step. So what happened? Well. You kind of have it all here in this one ad that Pan Am actually ran. You kind of have the, the, the perfect cocktail of all the things that, that kind of went wrong, if, if you can call it that. So you have Concord up here saying that we're, we're coming with that. But then you have the same, basically a year before the advent of the 747. So now you have a situation where it's volume versus speed, because uh, this thing is three times the size of the passengers that it could carry. And then you have this thing, which is the American supersonic, the US super, uh, supersonic transport. Uh, and basically, America said, like hell, we're going to let the Europeans win at the next stage of supersonic transport. I mean, this is not some like anti-industrialist American thing that I have. If you read that mouse copy on the bottom there, it says, the United States supersonic transport to be built by Boeing Company and General Electric Engines is part of a joint US government industry effort to maintain American leadership uh, in uh, commercial aviation. So basically, we had to win. And if that didn't mean, not only did we have to win, but nobody else could win at the same time. So the American supersonic was well over twice the size, twice the capacity, and it was going to go uh, a good 35, 40% faster because America, you know? <laughs> Got to be bigger and faster. I mean, let's just talk about it. Um, we never finished. It, it 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 got too expensive and it got too it got too unwieldy. The Soviets actually did build one. Uh, they actually got to flying the 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 Tupolev before Concorde. So I'm always careful. It it was. Concord, you kind of have to say, was the world's only luxury supersonic airliner, because believe me, this was not luxurious. Uh, actually, people died. There were some crashes that we know about. And um, it was, 
It was also kind of nicknamed the Concord Ski. And also, I might say, <laughs> it looked very similar to Concord. I mean, I don't know, you know, but there was all this cloak and dagger stuff about KGB agents getting caught in the airport with Concord drawings in their suitcases and things like that. But this is um, a representation of the three of them lined up together so you could get a, so a sense of size and scale. So, um, but what, what was remarkable about Concord? What was so special about it? This is a picture that I took when I, when I had the pleasure of flying Concord on my 30th birthday. Concord flew at 60,000 feet instead of 30,000 feet. So at that altitude, the sky is black. You're literally at the edge of the stratosphere. You're, you're in, well in the troposphere, and you're so high you can see the curvature of the Earth. Because you're flying 1,350 miles an hour, you're flying faster than a speeding bullet. You're flying faster than the rotation of the Earth itself, which means that if you leave a destination and arrive at your point of, of arrival, you're going to get to your point of arrival before the time you left because you're flying faster than the Earth. Or if you were flying westward and saw the sun setting, you would see the sun rise because you could beat the sun because it was flying that fast. Or if you were flying and saw a regular airplane 30,000 feet below you going in the same direction, that airplane would appear to be flying backwards because you were flying twice the speed. And lastly, they would do this really fun little stunt where a regular airplane would take off at London, Concord would take off in New York, fly to London, and back to New York before that regular airplane got there. <laughs> just because they could. So, um, but it was at the time until Bezos or Bran uh, Branson get it together, uh, this was as close as you could get to being in outer space. Uh, so it's really about an idea of tomorrow delivered in the here and now where the sky is no longer the limit, all manifested through ingenuity and creativity. And that's what the book is about. As a graphic designer myself, I'm kind of enamored by the ideas of design where you see that exuberance, you see that enth enthusiasm reflected in all these objects. So uh, here you have things as quotidian as data processors, motor oil, uh, compasses, spark plugs, and you still see that exuberance and enthusiasm for tomorrow in this graphic design. Or the idea that children would not be playing with iPhones and iPads, but with toys that reflected ideas that came to us through science and innovation and aspiration uh, and representing things that could do wonderful things like fly faster, twice the speed of sound. Uh, Sir Terence Conran wrote our foreword for the book and he so eloquently said, Concord had that magic ingredient of the truly special and it helped the imagination of millions of people all over the world. Uh, Concord had this remarkable shape. I spoke a little bit about that, uh, but it was the um, engines that uh, brought us the thrust, of course. Now that they had um, only 15 Concords in service after all the airlines dropped their orders, what they did was they turned to a, a program of graphic design to um, create this ultra special experience. So British Airways created this very club-like environment where everything was kind of special so they could entice people on the very few 15 airplanes they had. Uh, just in case you forgot where you were, you had little Concords running around the, the glass. This is the uh, interior design by um, uh, the great uh, Raymond Lowy. Uh, it looks like something out of 2001. Uh, this was the uh, silverware, also designed by Raymond Lowy. Uh, Andy Warhol used to love to steal the silverware. So, and if you were sitting next to him and weren't taking your silverware, he would take your set. He was known to be a pack rat. But on the point of Mr. Warhol, it became the airplane that kind of the world's kind of most glamorous would fly, such as Her Majesty, Her Royal Highness the Queen, the Pope, uh, Heads of State and Heads of Rock, Jacques Chirac and Mick Jagger. And then uh, Sir Terence Conran, when he outfitted the uh, lounge for Concord at, at, at JFK, he filled it with all these kind of icons of great design of the 20th century, such as Eames lounge chairs and Bauhaus lamps. So uh, you were surrounded by all these kind of icons of great design all before you stepped on one of the great icons of design. And this uh, held true for all of the um, other iterations of the Concord lounges. Basically, everything that you touched uh, had the forethought 
of creativity that Concord had in it. Uniforms by the Queen's fashion designer, Edwin Ames, menus designed by Christian Lacroix. And then you would get these gifts, these presents that they gave out to everyone, which is what, um, which is in the spirit of what we're giving out tonight, these, these uh, boxes from Nina and LCP that um, contain all of these items so it, of, of Concord gifts. So everything was a manifestation of the original ideals of Concord. It was very small, it was very tight. These were the chairs that Sir Terence Conran did. He even got the logo into the armrest on the side there. And then people, when people complain about the size that these aren't, um, where are the pods, where are the couches, where are, where are the sleeper lie flat beds? This is like being in a Ferrari instead of a Bentley. Like what I had this interview with Mr. Brokaw, it was very tight and tiny in there. It says, you know, very small little airplane. That's because you're in a fighter jet with 100 people. So <laughs> there's no room for these giant sleeper sets. This on the left, is the interior by the wonderful Andre Putnam. On the right is her um, hotel suite for the Morgan's Hotel here in New York. They almost look identical. It was that same kind of elegance and simplicity and beauty that they put in everything uh, that she put in the design for Concord. And it was kind of like the perfect design, nothing more than nothing less than what was needed. You have the, uh, such as the Calamari's, uh, Calamini's uh, French press, the Eames leg splint, um, and now here's the idea of what luxury travel is, and it's absolutely ridiculous. This is about as modern as, going, as traveling on an ocean liner. Uh, and it's been proven to be ridiculous because they just ended the A380 this year. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. We don't need living rooms and state rooms and Burlwood and gold. We need to get there. Uh, <laughs> that's what we need. And sadly, this is our reality for travel today. You know, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the crash of Concord, which wasn't entirely Concord's fault, but basically was the result of cutting corners and sloppiness in care, in practice of, of, of design. Of course, the, the, it's a very little known f fact that after they fixed everything from this incident, the very first flight back in service was September 11th, 2001. So that also didn't help. But now we live in a world where economy prevails over scale and uh, economy prevails over speed. So the 737 is the most popular aircraft. And I say to this that this is one of my favorite pictures in the book because it is sad. This is the cabin crew service director. Claire, first of all, British people don't cry, so this is a big <laughs> deal. But also the idea that we can do better that we can do better because in our history of design progress, we rarely go backwards. Or as Andre Putnam so eloquently put it, to not dare is we've already lost. We should seek out ambitious, even unrealistic projects because things only happen when we dream. Or as Apollo 8 astronaut Bill Anders said, we came all this way to explore the moon and the most important thing we discovered was the earth. So the last thing I'll say on the view from 60,000 feet is, can we return to these ideas of progress, be it the fight against cancer, access to clean water everywhere, literacy, design that leads to a better understanding of each other and our best selves? We have the capacity, we have the obligation to engineer and realize the future that we should have today and tomorrow it's time to show the world that kind of future again. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Well, I feel like when so many designers, you know, they, they, they want to wear the hoodie, the streetwear is so popular now today, you know, the, the, the sneakers. But we're talking about Concord. We're talking about um, the, this object that kind of manifested this, this elegance and uh, the, the experience was elegant and everything about Concord was elegant and special. Uh, so it just seems fitting and more comfortable to, I just wouldn't feel comfortable talking about Concord in like um, a black hoodie from Supreme. 
I mean, no offense against Supreme. How I mean, many? the Supreme sweatshirt is probably more expensive than the suit, honestly. <laughs> How many of those do you have? The Supreme or the suits? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, both. I'm I curious. have a, a few suits. I'm going to be honest, no Supreme. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, before we talk about your glorious new book, um, let's talk a little bit about the Golden Record. You did mention it at the beginning of your talk, so I felt like it gave me permission to ask you a few questions about it. I was one of the Kickstarter supporters. I love, love, love the Golden Record. Thank you for your um, support. It's very rare for an inter interdisciplinary designer um, to win a Grammy Award, so congratulations. You're, you're much more than a music designer, so to have the pinnacle of the music awards is quite a, is quite an accomplishment. Um, second, one thing that astounded me when I saw the Voyager documentary was how once the space the spacecraft left our solar system, it would be another forty thousand years before it reached another celestial body. Yes, it is. It's. I wanted to go quickly because I wanted to get into the conversation with you. The, Voy the two Voyager spacecrafts are the only human-made things ever to leave our solar system. Right. So that's kind of a huge thing, and, and that led to the Carl Sagan's um, pale blue spot. The, the number before it reaches the next galaxy, um, it's a lot of years, and it really is very humbling that you, um, it puts us in scale. Right. Of the universe and 40, working on thousand years it's yeah incredible. yeah it's it's incredible uh and it, it we are really and this is what the essence of the pale blue dot speech is and if you don't know it, i recommend you looking it up on on youtube it's probably one of the most beautiful pieces of of, of writing ever but the idea that we are on this piece of dust floating in space and the the infiniteness of space is is so overwhelming and humbling that things like trade wars or wars or racism or fighting with your brother and sister really shouldn't matter because we should just all be the best we can be um, while we're on this blink of a piece of a dust for a millisecond. So that's that, that was a big learning experience for me on the Voyager. Did you think about what the impression would be of any other intelligent life coming into coming into proximity with the golden record? It's fun to imagine. Uh, and it, 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 I, we did work with Carl Sagan's widow, and I wanted to ask her why they excluded religion and things like that. And I, I could imagine why. It, that, and that's why they put only our best side. And it, it is that kind of like- Humanity on its yeah, best day. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, our Insta, it's our best Instagram selfie. You right. know, just kind of, um, I- and in, in some ways, it's not a fair this depiction because it, it doesn't show um, hate and violence and things like that. Uh, I, I, it, but it, what it does show, it's, it, 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 is, it is a beautiful world. And, and there's not just in humanity, but in biology and geology. And, and there's a lot of things microscopically and globally and architecturally that are beautiful and inspiring. Uh, and uh, one more thing, but... When they recorded the greetings at Cornell University, they let the um, the native speakers speak whatever they, they they could say whatever they wanted to the extraterrestrials in their own idioms. And we in the book we have a a table and a chart of what they say, and it was really kind of beautiful to see culturally the differences of what. So like the Swedish person is very like rigid. Greetings from a laboratory at a university from Sweden, and then you know the the, the Farsi one is is really beautiful like. Greetings to our brothers in the stars. So it was like kind of beautiful to see like all these kind of very hopeful and the warm Americans gestures. are like, "Hey, mom." <laughs> uh, actually, Teasing. the 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 English uh, the English one is Carl Sagan's son, and he said he says greetings from the children of planet Earth. Yeah, close so, enough. Yeah. Um, you you start your new book Supersonic with a quote from Sir Lawrence Conran, who also wrote the foreword, who stated that the Concorde was not only the most iconic aircraft of all time, but also the most beautiful and exhilarating man-made object he had ever seen. And you go on to write that the Concorde was instantly recognizable, immediately eye-catching, 
and so unspeakably elegant that it became one of the great design icons of the modern age. How did this happen? What made it so incredibly special? Well, to me, it looks like a Mogliani sculpture uh, or, or a Brancusi sculpture. It looks like this beautiful futurist kind of swan. The, the French called it the, the white swan. I'm not going to try to say it in French because that Darn. would be really bad. But um, the, the truth is it wasn't set out to be designed as a beautiful object because it is the ultimate instance of form following function. That The shape was predicated by the physics. And that's, to me, if you're a believer in that idea that, that nothing more than nothing less than, than what's needed in design is the most beautiful design, like Adita Rahm's kind of idea, that, that is what the Concorde manifests. The fact that there's something about it that is this beautiful sculpture, um, to me is so pleasing. And then of course, if you look at these big A380s, they look like kind of hot dogs or you know sausages. Well, you know, there was something very bird-like about yeah. the Concorde in a way that a more conventional airplane couldn't mimic. Yeah. Um, you, your fascination with the Concorde began with a model kit. Um, in the introduction to Supersonic, you detail how the one to 72 scale version awed you and stirred nascent thoughts of becoming a designer someday. So, so how did you get the model? What was, what, was that really your first introduction to the whole notion of design? How old were you? I, it, I hear somebody uh, laughing. A little <laughs> kid. Uh, it, it was also a kind of a coalescence as a kid of the 70s. You mm -hmm. know, you'd see it in movies. It was in a James Bond movie. There was the Airport 77 movies. It was just seemed to be around a lot. And um, the, it, there was just, it was just something about it just like, what's, what's that? You know, it just looked so different than anything else. Uh, being that young, I didn't know until I was a much older designer or at California College of the Arts that I even came to understand what graphic design was. Um, but these ideas, these aesthetic objects, I was drawn to. Um, and the Concorde just had so much magnetism to it. Um, and I think I, I don't think I was alone in that. I think a lot of kids were, were kind of inspired absolutely. by it. Absolutely. I'm yeah. also a child of the 70s and was absolutely fascinated. But given your fascination with the Concorde, what made you more interested in design rather than engineering or product design or architecture? Well, I just had like a natural pro proclivity for art. So while other kids were like playing basketball or, or baseball, I was you were busy. a nerd. I was a nerd. Yeah, totally, just <laughs> drawing. But also, uh, you 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 become good at it, and then you kind of get positive reinforcement. And you're like, hey, I can make a career out of this. And then, um, and then in the as you're graduating high school in the early 90s, you see like awesome illustrators and designers like Lucille Tanazis and Jenner from Morla and, and you know, the, this is all the California people and you're just like, hey, they, they seem to be kind of like doing neat stuff. I, yeah. I want Louise Sandhouse is in the and house. And Louise Sandhouse, my dear friend Louise, yes. So uh, it's, it's um, the, once you start to realize and for me, this is everything about design. Once you start to realize that you can make an impact on culture and make an impact on other people's lives, that's really fulfilling for me as a designer. And that's what the music stuff is all about, that, that you can, through a poster or an album cover or maybe an airplane, that you can make someone smile or, or an x-ray machine or whatever, but, but you, can, you can elevate the life we live in. And, and that was a practical application of art that was really... Um, fulfilling that I wanted to go for. So you've not only written this book, you have quite a collection of Concord memorabilia. I understand you have a collection of over 700 items. So, yeah, 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 more or less. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, audience, I, I would like you to, to know that he's looking at his wife. Yeah. Lawrence is looking at his wife for approval here. Thank goodness for the storage unit down below. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of things did you have? When did you start? How did you find the things? What's the most you've ever paid for something? Uh, well, uh, truth be told, I got started on it a while ago, and I, I had to calm down. I've had the objects for a long time. Lawrence's so, wife is not yeah, yeah. vigorously. So, uh, now the stuff is, is a little bit more expensive. When I was, when I was 
buying though it wasn't wasn't that but but you know the Raymond Loewy for all all the objects in the book are from my collection so and then of course most of my collection is is the graphic design and, and objects like that but the there are people who have more and more expensive stuff there are people who have like engines and tires and <laughs> like there's a guy in uh, uh somewhere in Idaho uh, Idaho that has like the nose and Wow. Yeah, yeah, so. There's quite a lot of Concord memorabilia to collect, and I, this, some of what I saw is just magnificent. Um, you showed some of the work that Christian Lacroix did with the menu. There were stamps, matchbooks, flasks, lug luggage tags, lighters, and then other art items that were on board um, and not really intended to be given out, but as you mentioned with Andy Warhol, that were outright stolen, mm -hmm. menus, dinnerware, napkin rings. Um, did you steal anything when you were on your trip? Yeah, I brought a duffel bag with me on my flight. Um, I'll be honest with you, I my flight I was <laughs> uh, two bags before, uh, two bags, two uh, months before the, end, the last flight. Uh, it was also post 9-11, so I had plastic cutlery, so that was kind of a sad, but honestly, Debbie, it was really m more about just taking it in. I, I yeah. didn't have the heart to like g walk off with a plate or anything like that, you know, so um, <laughs> I, I took like some um, coasters and things and, and, and stationery and things like that, yeah. And a seat. No. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. I took my memories. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your flight in a moment, but when the Concorde was um, in 2003, mm -hmm. um, it cost $12,000 to fly round trip on the Concorde. What did it cost when the Concorde first started flying in 1969? Uh, about that equivalent uh, f adjusted for inflation. And so do you know what that would be now? I, I figured it out. You, oh, you did? I did. Okay. I did. Okay. For this interview. I thought I would surprise yeah. you. Yeah. $82,000. Wow. <laughs> $82,000. You know, it was, it was such a... Um, no, I'm not a math whiz, so it could yeah. be wrong. But I, I did do, like, I put in the number and inflation from 1969, so... I, I mean, I talked to a lot of people who have flown it, and... Um, because it was basically what in business they call lost leader. Mm. They would just, some tickets were, sometimes you could be on there like with four other people. It was, unfortunately it was yeah. not commercially viable. One of the things that I loved seeing in your book were some of the vintage pictures of how people flew back in the 60s and 70s. And it was so glamorous. I don't know if anybody noticed there was a tweet that went viral today of a man um, with bare feet um, using his toes to um, navigate the on-flight television system. <laughs> and he had a dog under him um, on, on the flight. And I, I thought, gee, we've come really far. <laughs> Yeah, really no, far since then. As mentioned, I, we just stayed at the TWA hotel last weekend. Julie and I were checking out. We were saying goodbye to the room. They have the, 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 the playlist is perfect. The ambiance is there. Every the stewardesses are dressed up in uniform. And then we see this gentleman with his bare feet up. And I'm like, you know, you're ruining the whole thing for everyone. Like, it just, can we just have some dignity? And, and just, re, re, it, it's about making a, good experience for others. And you may want to be barefoot, I get it, but come on. <laughs> I mean, one of the few things that we still dress up for as an organized group is the opera. But even there you see quite a range of, of outfits and fashion. Um, do you think it's because we feel that the airlines have so little respect for us that we feel that we don't need to reciprocate. I really, I'm just so curious about the change in sort of the zeitgeist about how we travel and how we present ourselves while we're traveling. No, it's it's a really great question, Debbie, and and you open by asking about the suit and and what you wear does kind of predicate how people perceive you. I mean, there's that very famous. Um, the 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 Andrew Bell experiment where he's playing the violin in the Metro subway and he's dressed up like just as a popper. Um, the uh, I think it's because we live in an era where people give zero cares as to what 
I thought you were going to say zero Fs. Zero Fs. I want to keep it clean here at the Cooper Hewitt. Uh, (laughs) This is a federal institution. Uh, People don't care about what other people think. And I think um, in this era of tweeting and sharing things and the share, we, 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 we should care a little bit about what other people think. And that, you, you, that doesn't mean you have to wear a suit, but you can, that could be, be your like best maybe. Self, right? Yeah, be your best self. Maybe your best self doesn't involve pajamas and a pillow in the airport. <laughs> Uh, 2019 marks 50 years since the Concorde's first successful test flight on March 2nd, 1969. And it also marks 15 years since your flight uh, from JFK to Heathrow. Um, You were just shy of your 30th birthday. Um, At that point, Concorde announced that the service would be ending. How hard was was it for you to get a flight? I know that it was very difficult to get a flight. There was a couple from Ohio, I believe, that bought two tickets on eBay, one-way tickets, for $60,000. Yeah, I think that was they were on the last flight, that, okay. the, the, yeah. that couple. And then uh, I just, the minute they said, we're pulling the plug, I... I bought my ticket. Um, it was my only regret is that my wife didn't come with me. That was a that was a mistake. But I was like I was already kind of um, obsessed with the Concorde. But uh, I was just like, don't be a jerk. This is the time. Um, this is the time to go. And uh, it was. I'm glad I did. And I went on my birthday. It was the shortest birthday I ever had because. <laughs> Uh, I went e- w- New York to so, but it, three hours later, my birthday was over. Ah, yeah. now did you take the round trip right back, or did you spend some time in London? I spent some time in London. Uh, Julie joined me. She flew subsonically. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold everything. Yeah. No, well, it was we. First of all, we weren't married yet. We so were not what? married. <laughs> I'm not even sure if we were dating. We were friends. Now I'm in hot water. You I'm in the hot seat. Are. But no, she had a business trip and I can't even. <laughs> but she had it. <laughs> but okay. So <laughs> now you you were surprised at how tiny the windows were. Yes. yes. Why why were they so small? Oh, because of the the stress of the that the the pressure that the plane would go on in that speed. Actually, it got so hot that the plane would expand ten inches in flight and then contract ten inches. Now, as it landed. could you actually feel that? Because you said that it would expand seven to ten inches. Then, when it landed, did it retract? There was a there was a gap in the cockpit that accommodated for that, and wow. the ca- uh, the pilots could put their hat in. The gap during the while it was open, and then when it was land, the the hat was like in this metal. It was like that wall there. It was like wow. closed. So, um, and then that's also why it had to be white because any other color would generate so much heat that, um, yeah. You stated that the difference between a Concorde flight and any other commercial flight could be felt as soon as it left the gate. And I was wondering if you could explain why there was a very specific kind of turn it needed to make. Yeah, well, at takeoff, you're, you're almost like 25% faster. And it just, you know, on a regular airplane, you go and you go and you go and you're up. This thing, you, you feel like you're in this fighter jet and it just up and go and you're gone. And then they did this noise abatement thing at, at Kennedy. So the, uh, the and it would just do this pivot and turn and go. And it was just like when you see fighter jets go and you're instantly in the other direction. Also, when Concorde leaves the gate, they run it to the front. Of, they ran it to the front of the line of the queue on the tarmac, so there was no like it was. It was all about time, so right. everything was just um, fast. And you said that breaking the sound barrier was barely noticeable, and you only heard it because you were watching and listening for it. So, what was that like? Well, yeah, I was. You know, that's kind of like the moment. And right. the, by the time I was on there, there was regular flyers, but also fans of Concord. Everyone kind of doing a last hurrah, and you have in the bulkhead that readout. Um, and then once it breaks the sound barrier, people are taking pictures and clapping. Wait, and, what and were they taking pictures of? 
um, of the of each other. It was it was <laughs> it was kind of like a, it was like a party. It yeah. was really like you were like kind of. And they ply you with some champagne, okay. before, you know. And um, it was just like we 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 did it. Did we, it have a know, sound? Was there uh, just like this faint little pop outside that? But you know, people expect like this kind of um, push or something like that. But um, it it uh, it was pretty regular. <laughs> 